In today's lesson, we're going to delve into the, the idea of continuations. And we've talked a bit about continuations implicitly or informally when we say just a function that will uh, run at the end. Uh, but now we're going to make this as a first class uh, subject. Not a first class in, as in the sense that we say first class functions, but we're going to give it a lot of, um, we're going to use the idea of uh, continuations as a way to express a control flow. So let's do that. Um, first, let's define what we mean by a continuation. And you can think of a continuation as just the program state and some code that needs to be run, the remaining code to run. Some time people, sometimes people talk about um, the limit continuation, uh, but these are more technical terms that have to do with how the semantics of a continuation. But here I'm just saying, imagine you have a piece of code, a uh, point at the middle of the execution, a uh, uh, middle of the file, and if there's some instructions after where your finger is pointing at, that will be the continuation. So uh, all the code that runs until starting from where you're pointing at until the end. And of course, if, when, when you're pointing at, uh, that should be, uh, where continuation is a notion of at runtime, not at, not specifically at compile time. So it means that you know it's a program execution that it ran up until a certain point, and then there's you know variables have values associated with it. There's some notion of program state, right? The environment, um, and there's an, a notion of what code needs to run after this. So basically, you have a program counter, and you have the environment of variables and values. Continuations are used a lot in implementation of programming languages. Um, they are used to encode exceptions, generators, uh, which I'll cover in today's lesson, and also coroutines, which I will not cover in today's lesson. And coroutines are a way of uh, encoding lightweight threads. So if you heard of threads, and if you've heard of um, fibers and all that, this is where this world works. Um, so how can we represent continuations? Um, there is a first class construct called really a, co a continuation in Racket. And that's something that is a really kind of confusing to think about. And I'm going to talk a bit about it, uh, but to a lesser degree because it's not as prevalent and is not as important in other programming languages. What I'm going to cover in more detail is um, the idea of continuation passing style. I'm going to define what, what is continuation passing style. And just as a disclaimer, it's a, a notion of inversion of control. So, continuation passing style. The question is, how do you ab abstract computation, right? Computation. And one way that you might want to do that is by doing this idea of uh, inversion of control, right? Inversion of control is also known as the Hollywood principle. Don't call us, we'll call you. So whenever you have some code, uh, that is going to perform something and you give it and someone else is going to call it, right? So like a callback or um, whenever we had like functions, um, like a map, right? Where you pass that function as the parameter of the map, uh, the map will call the function, right? The, the function is not called directly by, uh, by us, it's map who is calling it. So us, the callers, um, just call map and map will do the Hollywood principle whenever it needs it it will call that f, a parameter of map. So the idea of inversion of control is really to um, abstract away how and when a certain piece of code is going to be run. So uh, continuation passing style is what is you want to avoid or you want to control basically the, the basic the underlying idea behind CPS in functional programming. Uh, is really that you want to have control over the final result, the final return value. So what you want to abstract is exactly that. And how do we abstract things in, in functional programming? Yes, the answer is we create a lambda or a function, right? So if you have direct style where you return uh, x plus 2, in CPS you would have an extra parameter that would take the result of the final computation. Let's call it uh, ret for return, and whenever you want to return the value, you call this function, uh, and you pass the value you want to return to. Okay, so by doing this very simple technique, where you add an extra parameter and you use that parameter to return a value, 
uh, by calling it, right? Whenever you call it, you're passing the value to it. Uh, you are abstracting the notion of return, okay, with a function. And what can we do th with that? Why is that useful? It seems like such a simple and harmless thing. How could that even have uh, power? Well, that's the subject of today's lesson. So, have we seen CPS before? Yes. So, for instance, when I introduced the idea of tail recursive optimization, essentially what we did was we rewrote the map as a CPS version of map, right? So notice, please note what's going on. What we have now here, this accumulator, is actually this tower of lambdas that I talked about, right? But you can think of that as really the return, right? Because when you get to the end of it, uh, a function abstracting the return, right? Whenever we terminate the, the recursion, right? When the list is empty, we call, we pass the result to it. The result is the empty list, right? What we're doing is at each iteration point, we are creating a new uh, function that is gonna return, right? So we're updating the continuation, right? That's what we're doing at every step. So we start with this continuation that is just lambda x returns x. So it returns whatever was given to it. Uh, and then at each iteration point, what we do is we update, we create a new continuation, lambda x, that uh, changes what has been, what's going to be returned to the accumulator. That's basically what's going on. So I assume you already understand this algorithm, but the basic idea that I want to show is like this programming style where you always return uh, by you always return the final value by calling a function. This is the idea of continuation passing style. Okay, so we've seen CPS before. So now let's try to do something very simple, which is we're going to start with something very innocent, which is this slide, which is this idea of encoding uh, exceptions with CPS. Okay, it's a very powerful idea. Exceptions, as you might have uh, used in Java or in Python, how do they work? Well, you can any code can at any point uh, break the execution by throwing an exception. Uh, and then code, when you run some code, you can install a handler that says try to run this code. And if it has if it works properly, just return the value of it. Otherwise, um, catch the exception, you have a try catch, and then you can do something with it. you can return something else, right? Um, so for instance, whenever you have an expression, you want to, uh, if you have a division by zero, as we saw before, you, you, one idea is you can throw an exception. And indeed, that's the default under, uh, semantics of bracket. But let's say you don't have that in your language and you want to implement it. What I want to show you is that it's possible to implement this idea of uh, try catch. It doesn't have to be necessarily part of the language. You can implement the, the same mechanism try catch uh, with the following library that I'm going to explain now. Okay, so the basic idea is this. An exceptional code has or a CPS code is a function that takes two parameters. And the two parameters are going to be the function you call when the result is okay. And another function, the second parameter is the continuation that you run when um, there's an error. Okay. So in the division, in the safe division, this is pretty obvious, right? If the op, the Y is zero, then you should uh, raise an exception, throw an exception, right? Otherwise you should return properly. So what we have, okay, an error, you call function error when you, you see an error and you call function okay when the result is okay. Pretty intuitive, right? So let's actually have this already written here. Okay, so this is this code right here. I'm going to comment out everything else. I'm going to uncomment it as we go. Okay, so here's my code. I don't think I need any of this. So this is the function safe. I can actually make it a bit bigger. And now the only thing I did was I have two additional parameters. 
um, that are the continuations, the OK continuation and the erroneous continuation. So if the Y is, is zero, then we call the erroneous continuation. And if um, the division is OK, I call the OK. Otherwise, if Y is different than zero, then I call, I return the value. So that means I call the OK thing. So how do we use this? Well, the way we use it is if we do safe, let me call this. If I just call safe, what you'll see is there a hello world. Ah, oh, we want 32, right? Oh, we want CPS. So if I just run this, we just run the safe division. What that returns is this function. Okay. And the idea is because of inversion of control, we're not actually calling this function. So if I want to, um, if I want to return the value of it, I need to call, I need to pass two functions. One that is called when the value is okay. And the other one, when the value is erroneous, right? So we can do that. I create, I went ahead and I created two functions. So this function, when it's given an X, I wrap it in a pair and I wrap it with okay, just so we can distinguish it. And the other one does something similar, but instead of wrapping okay, it wraps error. So if I want to call it, I can do, can do safe division two divided by zero. And what I can do is I can pass default. Okay. I can pass default fail. And as you can see, well, this is no longer needed. So I'm going to comment it out and delete it. So when I run this and I pass default, okay. And then pass default value, what it's happening is since Y is zero uh, and I've already passed these two functions here. So these, this code has already been instantiated. So now you only have this Y is zero. So it means I'm going to call error this. What is error is going to call default fail. What default fail does, it creates a pair with error and X. And that's why we see error dot division by zero. Okay. Because we return in the error function division by zero. Okay. And the way we return is calling. So you can think of, and actually this is already giving us something, some insight that perhaps some of you have not thought about this, which is. Uh, you can look at an exception as just two kinds of return value, right? Where you can return by using return, or you can return by using throw. There are actually just two ways of returning, of terminating a function and returning a value. It's just that the way you write the try and the way you continue executing a function, the first. So what you do with a continuation of either error or of calling OK is what changes. But the principle is actually basically returning, right? It's, it's basically the same. There's just a little flag that you say, I'm returning with OK and I'm returning with error. OK, so we can even change this. And instead of saying print OK, we could write display, say OK. And then we do display ln x. Okay, and we can do something similar. <clears throat> and here I want to write error. If I run this, I get error division by zero. Pretty cool. So now I can do something similar. And I can do division by one. Now I see OK, 2. So 2 divided by 1 is 2. I'm going to see something even more interesting. 3 divided by 2. Good. So now it makes sense, right? This is the first one where you get the error, and here where you get OK. So, so far you're with me, hopefully, and this makes sense to you. So we did something very simple. We just, instead of re returning, we call a function. 
but we gave it two parameters to be able to distinguish between an okay return value and an erroneous return value. Okay, so far so good. So now, imagine we want to chain two divisions together. How can we do that? Right, okay, so how can we change that? So first thing we wanna do is we want to define these two functions. So first one is uh, 10 divided by two. Then one thing I wanna do is O2 is it will take the result of O1, goes to X, uh, right, the result of this. So I'm gonna represent the rest as a lambda. So assuming I already have this value and assign it to X, then what I have to do is divide X by three. So, or to put it another way, ideally what I would like to do, oops. Ideally what I would like to write is this, right? But uh, the problem is that this function takes two functions. So how do we chain them together, right? How do we call um, them together? Well, we can try to define our, our bind operator. So let's think, what we need to do is we need to pass O1 to O2. Right, but how do we return? The return is passed to OK, right? So it's kind of complicated. Maybe we need to have something that connects them together. So let's call this CPS bind, O1, O2. Okay, so O1 is gonna be this first operation. And then, bind must take an OK and take an error. So then what should it do? Okay, so then it should um, call O1, right? And I'm gonna pass OK and error, OK and error. So if I pass O1, this would simply run O1, right? So if I do CPS bind and I pass O1, um, O1, O2, and I pass Right, so this should return this lambda, okay? And now if I want to pass, how do you call it, uh, default okay, and then default fail. So this should just run, let me comment out the other two. Okay, so this should just returns five. Um, and now if I want to bind, okay, I have, this means that if I run this, the continuation of O1 will actually be delivered to uh, default OK. So if I want to deliver the result of five to my operation two, then why don't I just pass O2 as the continuation, oops. So if I do this, that means I'm gonna send the result of a one into O2. And what that's gonna return is a lambda, right? Because O2 receives X and then returns the lambda XY, lambda OK error. So that seems fine. And then with error, so any error message that I send should be sent to the error message. So that also seems fine. Let's see if this is enough. Okay, so um, what I see is that then I receive my procedure as before. So um, when I call this function, it actually returns a function that is expecting an okay and an error. So let me pass this here. So let's see if everything went well. So what I did first, I have five divided by two is five, and then I divided five by three, which is five thirds. So now let me divide by zero and see if I get an error. Yeah, got division by zero, which is perfect. 
let me divide here by zero to see if I get an error. Aha. Uh -huh. So this is saying that if uh, O1, so it, I get this weird error saying that, comment this out. I get um, division by zero and then I get uh, not an error, which is weird. So why is that? Let's think. So what what is happening here is that O1 is returning OK values to O2. And O2 uh, is returning erroneous, and O1 is returning erroneous values to error, right? Um, so when I call, and in, in my case, the first operation is returning an error. So if it's returning an error, and I'm passing default fail, uh, this is passing uh, the error as is. So if we want to pass it to the second thing, so then the, the second thing is a function, right? So the problem is that this whole thing define What's happening here is if O1 is succeeds, then uh, it should return an effectful operation, right? And uh, not an effectful, a CPS operation, right? Which is this thing that takes uh, an OK and an error. But if our error fails, then it's not calling error, which is a problem, right? It's not returning an effectful operation. So what we want to do is, uh, if that's the case, then we want to do lambda takes error, takes an OK. And what I want to do is, actually, let me think a bit. CPS not very obvious. This is what we want to do. Okay, let's look at the final thing. Yeah, so the result, you take the, yeah, this is not obvious. <laughs> um, you take the result um, when something is okay, it runs this. If something fails, it, it runs the error as before. Okay, but if something works, what you want to do is you want to call, you want to take that result, right? And you want to call it with this. Why do you want to call it with this? Because you want to say that I want to I want to call O2, which is my continuation. I want to pass the result of O1. And then that thing in itself should return something that has an OK and an error. So in the OK, I'm passing the final result because I need to communicate somehow the result of O2 and plug it into my return. And then the error, I need to plug it here as well. Okay, so the way I like to think of this is really kind of like uh, connecting something. So I want to, I have, if I have my okay, let me call it okay, instead of right. Okay, so what this is saying is if I have O1, right? In O1, I'm going to pass it, I'm redefining what does it do when the value is okay. But when the value is er erroneous, you plug whatever was given to you. So any error you return you forward it to error, okay? But the problem here is that what you want to pass, what you want to send to OK has to be the result of operation two, not operation one, which means that you need to override um, the continuation, the OK continuation of O1 so that it, it will run O2. So how do we do that? We pass a lambda that accepts the result of O1, and then what does it do? It passes O1 the result to O2, so instantiates this, right? It's passing this X. So this would be X right here. Um, calls that, passes that. And the result of O2 is going to be, again, an effectful thing. And for that, you have to send the OK and error, the normal OK and error, which means that if O2 sends an OK, ultimately it will send it to the original OK, and if errors will go directly to errors. And then this whole thing works. So let's see if it works. 
So in this case, I got division by zero. So let's see if I do here. In this case, I get division by zero. And then do a two and everything works well. So chaining things together is basically the monadic uh, bind. So in the next video, I'm going to summarize how the bind works again, as we've seen it now. Uh, and then I'm going to explain how do you do other operations that are similar to bind.